just a housekeeping um, thought or two. Um, we had a, an AA meeting here, um, and uh, there was some powerful uh, sobriety talk from people that really had much more time than I, and uh, it, was just, it, was, it was great. The uh, resentment center hasn't reported to me yet on the <laughs> syllabi. <laughs> And, uh, but you're going to keep it going. That's it. But I do want to um, I do want to say two or three things about books and orders and stuff like that. As I said, um, I don't know how many more of those um, newsletters back there there are. You might find them useful. It will certainly contain the Bible verses. Uh, and if they run out, we've got some more before you leave. But I, sometimes at conferences, people take off on Sunday early or something like that. So I just covered it. Um, I hope uh, I have special order sheets, and if if you don't use them, you could use a general one and just write on there. I would really like to see as many people as care to uh, buy this syllabus, and I am, it's fourteen ninety five. And if I have to send it from Maui, it's an is, an additional three seventy five. And probably it's just as well that we didn't have them because many times you would have been diver- distracted and looking at your. Um, at your book rather than listening and this way if you do choose to get the syllabus uh, you'll have it at home and it also relates to my books in other words if it says quiet time and you really want to dig into quiet time somebody's taken my uh, my book the books early AA's read and if you borrowed it please return it and if you've stolen it you don't have to um, we'll give you amnesty but one way or the other uh, those books are are to be sold to anybody that wants or needs them after uh, after the conference, and if nobody wants them, that's okay, too. A couple of people have put their word in for a couple of books. But if you want uh, a set of the books or any individual books, there are order sheets up there. But as I say, I would particularly urge you to get this syllabus, and uh, somehow it's going to turn up somewhere before long, and whether it turns up here or not. Uh, if you're leaving uh, tomorrow and you want to uh, put a sign an order sheet and either pay for it or put a credit card or give me a check or something, that's fine. So with that, we'll dive into Ann Smith. Now, why is she so important? Apparently, she's not. But uh, Dr. Bob's and her son, Smitty, said, this is it's you're the only person that seems to be writing about and recognizing my mother's importance. And since we may have a little more time, I'm sure not going to run late tonight, but um, I'm going to take the time to read you what people said about Anne because I love this woman even though I've never met her. And um, it's just fantastic what she was doing. And she's been ignored. Even in Dr. Bob and the Good Old Timers, they sent a man out from New York to write Dr. Bob and the Good Old Timers, and he went to see Smitty, and Smitty said, are you going to put my mother in that book? And the man from the staff in New York General Services said, no. And he said, then I'm not going to tell you a damn thing. Nothing. And he phoned his sister in, in Akron and said, Susie, don't you tell him anything. She said, I won't. So this guy goes trotting around, and uh, either he got a spiritual awakening or something, and he finally returned at the end of the thing, having interviewed Clarence and a few other people, and maybe he got the message that Anne was probably more important than he thought, and he came back and he said, okay, we'll put her in the book. So then, um, Smitty, uh, there are lots of quotes in Dr. Bob and the Good Old Timers and so forth. But that's how tough it was. Uh, to get her even in the book and then her journal which recorded and taught early AAs just plain hasn't been looked at. I don't see it mentioned any place. I got the original and made four bound copies and gave one to Dr. Bob's home and the next time I went back it was missing. How could you be in Dr. Bob's and Ann's home and have a free <laughs> bound copy of her notes and not have it out for somebody to see. So you tell me what's wrong with the Ann Smith story. All I know is nobody knows it. 
And now they, Hazleton is putting something out, and they ask another guy to write about it, and it's the same old baloney that is in the existing AA books. It's the same old stuff about Ann Smith, and you still have a clue as to what she really believed. And what she believed is what she taught. And how she acted in love is critically important because it has a lot to do with how we can get well. So away we go on Ann. She's been ignored. In fact, John Seiberling is saying, my mother, Henrietta, and Annie have been treated as if they were the ladies that came to the meeting and poured coffee. And they have. And some people have thought that. Oh, these are the, these are the wives. These are these, those old gals that, you know, poured the coffee and greeted it at the front door. Henrietta was the one that conducted the meetings lots of times, Henrietta Cyberling. And Ann Smith, was, she had a certain chair, and her focus was on the newcomer, and everybody said she made him we feel welcome. And so this lady was a, a worker in the trenches as well. She wasn't just a lady who poured coffee. What did they say about her? I think it's important because if you hear what they say about her, the question is, should we know about her? And just because of who she is and what they said about her would be enough. But to know what she said is critically important to understand what early AAs did because it's the only written, accurate written record of what we did. The rest of it is just baloney. It's disappeared. Bill Wilson said she was quite literally the mother of our first group. Acra number one, her wise and beautiful counsel to all, her insistence that the spiritual come before anything else, her unwavering support of Dr. Bob and all his work, all these were virtues which watered the uncertain seed that was to become an AA. In the full sense of the word, she was one of the founders of Alcoholics Anonymous. Well, why at Founders Day is there nothing about her? Her journal is not available to look at, and I gave one copy to the home and one copy to the archivist, and he travels around the country, and hopefully he'll have it out there. And the only pictures on the stage will not be, will not include Ann Smith. And yet she was a founder of AA, and it's Founders Day. And then he said, and this is from the language of the heart, both of these, then, after a few weeks, came a lull on the 12-step front. And this time, Anne and Henrietta Sarbling infused much-needed spirituality into Bob and me. Wouldn't you want to know what they infused? I did. That's why I went back and John Sarbling said, you can have an hour. And three hours later, he said, Dick, I got an ulcer. We've got to quit. I've got a class right after this. And he took me to lunch anyway. And that's been the story. You know, when you open these people up, they've got plenty to say especially if you ask them non-leading questions. And then, uh, a description and pass it on, reading from her chair in the corner, she would softly conclude her reading of the Bible, faith without works is dead. As, and imagine that. Why did they want to call it the James Club? Why did Bill Wilson call it the Works Publishing Company? Why do we say at the end of a meeting, keep coming back at work? Because all Henry was reading the book of James to him a lot, and always ended the thing, not with the Lord's Prayer, because this just was just her, just her in-house sharing, but she'd quote from the book of James, faith without works is dead. It's all over the place. As Box, Dr. Bob described it, said Bill, they were convinced that the answer to our problem was in the good book. Now, Bill said that. To some of us older ones, he said, Dr. Bob said, the parts we found absolutely essential were the Sermon on the Mount, the 13th chapter of 1 Corinthians and the book of James. Considered absolutely essential to what? To getting well. So wouldn't we want to know, even if it didn't come to Dick's seminar, wouldn't we want to know what the Sermon on the Mount, 1 Corinthians 13, and the book of James had to say? I would, and I did. That's why I started studying this stuff and the Bible. The book of James, said Bill, was considered so important, in fact, that some early members even suggested the na James Club as a name for the fellowship. Now, others said, Lois Wilson said, Annie's part in the formation of AA and consequently in the foundation of Al-Anon should never be forgotten, especially by family group members. Arch T., who founded AA in Detroit and had lived with the Smiths and 
been helped by Ann, said, I've been taken off the street and nursed back to life by Ann Smith. doesn't say Sister Ignatia, it says Ann Smith. Why? Because he was there for months, a very sick man. And he said, I was not only penniless and jobless, but too ill to get out of the house during the day and hunt for work. So great was Anne's love, and so endless her patience with me, so understanding her handling of me, that ten months later I left a new man. Bobby, who lived with them for months, said, She had a quiet, soft way of making me feel at home. I shared a good many of my life's problems with her. She read the Bible and counseled me. Dan Kay said, this is all from Dr. Bob and the good old timers, Ann always looked to the newcomers. Betty Smith, her daughter-in-law, said, I doubt that any minister in any given week could have counseled more people, prayed with more people. In times of trouble, people rushed to her. Florence B. of Akron said, Ann was evangelist, nurse, salesman, employment bureau, sounds like our house out in Maui, all in one. Anne's personal religion was simple and workable. She never sought to rewrite the Bible nor to explain it. She just accepted it. So this is the lady, and you know, Bill was supposed to write a, a tribute to her, and he never wrote it. So Betty, uh, and he gathered a lot of letters from the old timers at the time of Anne's death, and Betty, his wife, dug them out and sent them to me, and I have copies of all of them. So this is just a smidgen of what was written about Anne. Uh, there were all kinds of personal letters about what she had done in their lives. Now, she wrote a journal, and it's 64 pages, and it's where the original is, nobody seems to know. But a completely accurate copy of the 64 pages with soul surgery stuffed in the back that's the Oxford group book and with, uh, and with confident faith the shoemaker book stuffed in the back and a shoemaker sermon or two uh, that's a stepping stone and it still is also in the archives and general services uh, is a copy and Dr. Bob's daughter wrote a letter to general services I don't go around stealing things I ask for them through channels and I get them and so I, I asked um, Frank M., the archivist, to take that to the Trustees Archives Committee with Sue's letter, and I had no trouble at all getting that, that uh, a copy of it. So if, as and when, you read um, my Ann Smith journal, and there's been so much garbage passed around that poor old Sue has said, Dick quotes his own books. No, I don't quote my own books. What I have done is there isn't any Ann Smith journal. Nobody can see it. It isn't. You know, it's locked away in stepping stones and locked away in New York. And have you ever gone to the archives and make you put on gloves and, and, and it's to protect things. Very hard and you can't copy anything there. And so what I've done is to take New York's um, numbers and have no numbers on the pages and use them in Ann Smith's journal. And then when I'm referring to Ann Smith's journal, I quote my own book because there isn't any place else for you to look. I've got a copy. Dr. Bob's home has two copies, if you can't see. New York has a copy that's locked up and stepping stones. I don't think anybody sees that stuff. And so, yes, I quote my own book because I want you to be able, when you're reading Turning Point or the Good Book and the Big Book, and I refer to Ann Smith's journal, to refer to my book, Ann Smith's journal, because that's the only thing you'll ever be able to refer to, but you'll see the whole journal pretty much laid out there in systematic form. Now, what's the significance of that journal? Well, it took me a long time to find that out, because nobody ever talked about it. And then I found an eyewitness, and he's on tape. He put it in writing, and the person who had the tape and the writing said this to me, uh, and it's a verbatim, from John R., who not long ago was the oldest living AA, he said, before one of these meetings, that's in Dr. Bob's home, Anne used to pull out a little book, her spiritual journal, and quote from it. We would discuss it. Then we would see what Anne would suggest from it for our discussion. So in the context of all the rest of the stuff, 
the Bible, quiet time, the devotionals, and prayer. There was Ann Smith's journal. Man, it was the heart. It was the heart of the real spiritual stuff that's going on. So at the risk of repeating myself more than 18 times, Ann Smith's journal is significant. If you want to know what was going on, what was going on is people were reading Ann Smith's journal. Whether she was reading it to them, and that was the format. It talked about the Bible per verses that were relevant, the Oxford group principles that were relevant, all the stuff I've been talking to you about uh, for the last uh, three or four hours is in Ann Smith's journal. I didn't get it from there. I got it from the original sources, but she got it and wrote it down and then taught it. So it's priceless in its information. Now, Sue Windows, her daughter, is convinced that there are a whole bunch of pages missing from it. And the story has gotten out that after Smith, Sue dies, they're going to publish the real thing. All I can say is, even though it's in rotten shape as far as organization goes, I can't see anything that isn't already in there. So if something else comes out, first of all, for, furthermore, Sue told me she didn't have any more information. And she's mad because New York lost her paper, papers. And so I doubt that that story has any truth to it. But I'd be the first one to want to see the pages if they show up after Sue dies. And Sue spends hours on Founders Day down there talking to newcomers and telling them about early AM. I just don't believe she's that far out that she would conceal something. In fact, if she were in the O.J. Simpson trial or, or, or working for Monica Lewinsky, she would have put out a book a long time ago. Take <laughs> some money on it. Anyway, I don't know about that. But all I know is there's a lot of good stuff in the journal, and Sue Windows is one of the few people that recognize that. That's Dr. Bob's daughter. So here we're going to kind of take a look at what's in that journal. Um, and I wrote down here, if Bill and Bob were developing the 12-step ideas, Anne was certainly learning them, teaching them, recording them, or all three. Uh, we won't cover the material that's already been set forth, that we've already covered. In other words, I'm not going to go through the Bible points that are relevant in the Oxford group and the Shoemaker teachings, because you've heard them directly, and if you get this syllabus, you'll have them forevermore in fairly simple form. But that stuff is in Ann Smith's journal as well. But w I want to sketch out with you the step ideas as Ann wrote them. Now, she didn't write 12 steps, but every single one of the 12 step ideas that I've talked to you about, she wrote about. Now, do you suppose that Bill was sitting there for three months listening to this and not absorbing it? No. Step one. Anne specifically mentioned the man manage me prayer that was popular with Bookman and Shoemaker several times. And she put in quotes. She says, what do we do? What do we do? And then she says, oh, Lord, manage me, for I can't manage myself. So where did unmanageability come from? Could it come from the Oxford group? Could it come from Shoemaker? Could it come from Charlie's prayer, Victor's prayer? You are guesses as good as mine, but I can sure think of an awfully relevant source that was presented to Bob and Bill, and that's Ann Smith's journal. Step two, using language resembling AA step, second step, Ann wrote, a stronger power, reminds me of your share, it's just me, but a stronger power than his was needed. I'm not, I'm not sure it was you, maybe it was our other friend. A stronger power than his was needed. God provided the power through Christ so that we could find a new relationship with God. Boy, those are terms that are in the big book. Step three, and here's all Annie. Try to bring a person to a decision to surrender as much of himself as he knows to as much of God as he knows. You know, Dick didn't invent this stuff. I got it from books and journals and interviews. And then she goes on. Stay with him until he makes the decision. And says it out loud. She added, Surrender is a complete handing over of our wills to God, a reckless abandon of ourselves, all that we have, all that we think that we are, everything we hold dear to God to, God, to do what he likes with. I can't think of a simpler statement of the third step concept. Some of the language uh, bearing a close resemblance. Step four. 
it's absolutely necessary to face people with the moral test. Fearlessness is the moral inventory. Criticism born of my own projection. Something wrong in me. Unless I can crystallize the criticism, I'd better look for the moat in my eye. You know the Sermon on the Mount? Look for the, look for the log in your eye before you start looking at specks in other people's eyes. Make the moral test, she says. Four standards, the four absolutes. Why I have been absolutely honest but not living it. Resentments to be faced and set right. Fear and worry are atheism. Just a glimpse of self-centered life. These were notes. In other words, Anne wasn't writing a treatise. She was jotting down ideas, and eventually her daughter typed up some of it. Some of it is in language that's very hard to read. It's in her own hand. But just think of it. The concepts in the fourth step about honesty, resentment, fear, self-centeredness. Anne was teaching this. She wasn't just writing it down. She was sharing it with people. They were discussing it. Step five. Confess your faults one to another. I must share to be honest with God, myself, and others. Man, how close can you get to the language in the big book and the steps? Step six. Be willing to ask God where I am failing and to admit sin. Step seven. Speaking of sins such as selfishness, dishonesty, and pride, Christ only can remove them. Remember when I said the word remove was so significant? It can be found originally, and I didn't cover this today, but it can be found, found in, in Psalm 103, uh, how God removes our transgressions. And then the Oxford group writer, Stephen Foote, was talking about removing the sin. And our step talks about it. And she said Christ can only remove them and replace with a new quality of life. Read Romans 12. So if you want to know what to study, Read Romans 12. She thought it was relevant. I can tell you what's in there. The first two verses are about the, the transformation. Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. Do not pretend you can go on lifting yourself by your own bootstraps. In all humility to God, what would thou have me to do? I am wrong, Father. Show me the way. Boy, those are such simple AA concepts and the language can be found in the big book and the steps. So if you want to know where the steps came from, you'll never see it any place. No matter whether we're reading Ernie Kurtz is Not God or this latest book or Back to Basics or anything else, you just don't see this stuff discussed. I don't know why. Maybe it's because nobody wants to take the time to look at Ann Smith's journal and really find out where these ideas might directly have come from. Steps 8 and 9. Any restitution I won't make? Resentments to be faced and set right? Restitution to be made? Help them make a list of things. God can make me willing in the day of his power. I mean, that's the kind of beautiful writing she did in sort of shorthand. Step 10. And I'm, I'm supplying the word steps. In other words, she doesn't have them written as steps. She's got to plow through um, 64 pages. But Sue Window says in, in hers and Smitty's book, you can see the whole program there. I can. Step 10, check your life constantly by the four absolutes. You know, continue to continue to take four more <laughs> and when we were wrong, promptly admitted it. Our lives will be one continuous surrender. Remember I said the fifth Oxford group idea was continuance? You don't just surrender once in terms of your sins and shortcomings. Man, I'm up to that stuff all the time. Our lives will be one continuous surrender, surrender to God of every difficulty that confronts us, each temptation, each spiritual struggle, laying before him either to take away or to show us in their proper spiritual proportion. Be willing to ask God where I'm failing and to admit sin. Step 11. Prayer, she said intercessory prayer. Pray that the Spirit may tell you what to pray for. You know, you don't make up half-baked prayers. God can tell you what to pray for. A way to find God's will, not to change it. Petitionary prayers. 
These we submit not because we distrust his goodness or desire to bend his will, but because he's our friend. Correct me. Direct, praise, adoration, and thanksgiving. Romans 2. Want to find out something about prayer? He says, read Romans 2. Might be a good idea to do that. Guidance. Guidance is the principle of the Bible. It's very structured, and it is. Boy, what insight this lady had. The whole Bible is the revealed word and will of God. She knew that. It's the principle of the Bible. It's very structured. was that God was laying out to holy men to write down the general principle, the universal will, if you will. And she says, we must be in such relationship with God that he can guide us. You've got to have a receiver. You have to be born again of the Spirit. You have to get the Spirit in order to get the message. If the shoes don't fit or whatever, the plus don't fit, you've got to equip. Specifically, guidance comes through intelligent knowledge of the Bible, through conscience, through circumstance. Guidance is thinking plus God. And then she quotes, I will lead you and guide you into all truth and bring all your thoughts to remembrance from the book of John. And she talks about listening. Watch your thoughts. Your thoughts can come from three sources. Subconscious, the devil, and God. That's pretty cool. Bible study and reading. Let all your reading be guided. Of course, the Bible ought to be the main source book of all. Why? Well, it's the whole structure of the guidance system. Quiet time. Effective quiet time. One, objective, God, and obedience. Two, attentive prayer and being willing to act immediately. Three, stillness and surrender of all known sins. You've got to get the receiving set clear, in other words. In addition, there are many specific comments about prayer, listening, reading, and so on that, that should be read to get the full flavor and depth of Anne's teaching. This is just a summary uh, syllabus. There's plenty more. Step 12, having had a spiritual experience. I like to do, divide the steps into elements, and I think most people would agree there are three elements in the, in the 12th step the spiritual awakening, the carrying of the message, and the practicing of the principles. So first, having had a spiritual experience, she said, a general experience of God is the first essential, the beginning. We can't give away what we haven't got. It's in the big book. We must have a genuine contact with God in our present experience. Carrying the message. Giving Christianity away is the best way to keep it. When we have that, general experience of God, witnessing to it is just natural, just as we want to share a beautiful sunset. If next year we have a seminar here, the topic may be uh, the golden text of AA on page 191. Now, Bob went rushing out and memorized it. You ought to take a look at it. You want to share this, and that's what Bill was saying. I've got to just say what, George, what the Lord has done for me in curing this disease. Okay, she said, um, start the person on a new life with simple, concrete, and definite suggestions regarding Bible study, prayer, overcoming temptation, and service to others. God's answer to materialism is a basis of Christian living that lifts above material things. Claim from God humility, patience, courage, faith, and love. So if you wonder what the 12-step principles are, Annie was writing about it. She was teaching about it. Where would she get this stuff? She didn't quote scripture. She knew this stuff. And so she just belled it out, and those people loved her, and they listened. And those are principles. You'll find them in the big book. Now, she didn't quit with that. She believed in growth. And the very thing in the big book that says there are many helpful books, be quick to see where religious people are right, ask your rabbi, minister, and priest, here's what she said. She specifically recommended a whole bunch of really good books. But she said the Bible came first. All reading should be guided. 
You know, you don't just go into a New Age bookshop and pick up a books on a book on tarot cards and start reading it and thinking you're really spiritual. Why not ask God what you should be reading? That's what she said. Then she recommended books on the life of Christ, books on life changing, all these Oxford group books like Life Changers and For Sinners Only and and there were about six of them. Books on prayer, books by Sam Shoemaker, books by E. Stanley Jones and Toyohiko Kagawa. The Smiths were big on love. And Kagawa wrote a book called Love, the Law of Life. Remember when the, Dr. Bob said in his last <coughs> message this whole cotton thick, thickened thing simmers down to love and service? Well, that it was about love God and love your neighbor. All the commandments, the law boiled down to one principle and service. And there were other books that would enrich the spiritual lives of those she counseled. And we'll be discussing those tomorrow morning. And also, if somebody's kind enough to return the book on that, you'll be able to look at it. The Oxford Goop ideas. Boy, she didn't quit. You know, first she talked about some general principles. And, and they were related to the specific step ideas. Then she talked about what you should read and said the Bible is numero uno. Then she talked about Oxford group ideas. And I'm not going to go over them all because we have. But they're all in there. All the Oxford group ideas that I've covered are in Ann Smith's journal. This little lady knew what she was doing. And she had been a school teacher. The Bible. All through Anne's journal are verses and comments about the Bible. She didn't recommend, not only recommended it and studied it and read it to others. When Bill and Bob were there every single day, they had a little quiet time with some substantial Bible reading. And she related that Bible stuff to the ideas in the Oxford group and the very step ideas we've been talking about. Why was she called the mother and the founder? That ought to be reason enough. You know, people are just crawling all over to get Oxford group books. And sometimes they get them and write a book about them and it hasn't got much to do with it. There are two books now. This one and the one there that say the, the what is the Oxford group was the Bible of the Oxford group. That's baloney. And then it says the Oxford group had four spiritual activities that were incorporated into AA. That's baloney. And so, you know, you got to, if, if you're inter as interested as a lot of people are in collecting Oxford group books, and man, they're sending to England and going to old bookstores and stuff, and my library isn't as good as one of my friends down in Los Angeles, and I'm writing books about them. I've seen them all because I've dug them out of libraries and, and seminaries and so forth, but I don't own as many. People are wild to own these Oxford group books, and I'm all for that. Except I'm not a member of the Oxford group. I'd rather get the ideas in simple form and, and then just verify that they're Oxford group ideas. But people are nuts about getting Oxford group books. And now they're nuts about getting Shoemaker books. Well, how about getting Ann's book? You know, <laughs> why doesn't AA finally get around to publishing history? And not just any history, but the history of a founder of Alcoholics Anonymous. One guy was around selling Clarence Snyder's letters for 10000 bucks for a page. My goodness, what we could do with 10000 bucks! Boy, give my son and me 10000 bucks and permission from Dr. Bob's kids, which they would give me, and I'd have Ann Smith published in its entirety, and you could try to wade through her handwriting. But we'd at least have that history. People will crawl for Oxford Group and Shoemaker Books, and, and pay 10000 bucks from a letter t from, <laughs> from Clarence Snyder, whom Bill Wilson hated? <laughs> and what about this, you know? How come it's not available? And what's so great about a, t a letter from Bill Wilson to Clarence Snyder that, that warrants 10000 bucks worth of profit? I don't see it. So, you know, this is something that is available. And she wasn't just an interested bystander. This is not just one of those black belt Al-Anon wives, you know. Not Annie. She helped found Al-Anon. But what she did is work with families. People came. Families came. Wives came. Kids came. Husbands, aunts, uncles, and so forth came to the Smith home.
to find out what do you do with a drunk. And she'd had a lot of experience. She had a household full of them. And she could talk to these people in spiritual terms. So she wasn't just a bystander. She got Bob interested in the Oxford group, and his interest sparked a three-year study of the Bible by him. She attended Oxford group meetings with Bob and with Bill. She'd been a teacher and she taught. She taught Bill and Bob from the Bible, the Oxford group literature, and the Christian literature of the day. She housed and fed and counseled and assisted the drunks that at times overwhelmed the Smith home. There were times when they had to get out of their own house. That's why I go over to Honolulu every now and then to get away from the drunks. You know, it isn't easy having a house full. I got four and they're driving me crazy. They had 30 or 40. And if you've ever been to Akron and taken a look at Bob's, Dr. Bob's home, you wonder where they even put them. You know, they've turned the basement into a souvenir shop. Maybe it was just a basement in those days, but that took a lot of doing and a lot of giving and a lot of sacrifice. She wrote the materials down in her journal and taught others from that. She communicated with many on the phone. She worked with alcoholics and their families. People came to the Smith home in the morning for every day for quiet time and donuts. And she got involved in quiet times with individuals. And she placed great store in working with newcomers. You know, Dr. Bob fixed them, to use the old-fashioned term. Ann Smith found them. In other words, by the time they actually started having meetings, instead of people just calling Dr. Bob and saying, can you fix my husband, why well, there were people beginning to come. And they needed the same kind of outreach that we do today. I hope we do. And that is, some poor soul walks in the door, and you, I'm trying to train my sponsees. Who are the newcomers in this room? Before they raise their hands, who are they? And it's a piece of cake if you start paying attention. The old-timers hopefully are happy. <laughs> Not always the case, but hopefully they got a smile like Mary has. Oh, okay, don't worry about Mary. She, she's okay. But this other person comes in, you know, and they're sneaking around and looking for the literature table and where's the bathroom and walking out to smoke 18 cigarettes so they won't have to talk to anybody. And, and you know, that's the newcomer. Go for him. Don't wait for him to raise his hand. Somebody else might get him. Well, they won't because they don't do that anymore. But she looked for those people. And she'd come up and she'd say, Welcome, my dear. My name is Ann Smith. And right away she melted him down. So it was Ann that was doing that outright outreach. And a great many comments in her spiritual journal are about how to work effectively with others in winning them to Christ and helping them change their lives. So one who has, is not, I'll submit this, and it's very controversial, and it's so gosh darn obvious, I don't know why we haven't seen it. A person who says he's familiar with Alcoholics Anonymous history and hasn't studied and read, read, read about and written about Ann Smith's journal isn't familiar with anything really significant about AA's history. Now, that's a controversial statement. You know, I, Mary, I think it was saying that she read avidly, Pass It On, and Dr. Bob and the Good Old Timers Today. That's how I started my quest. And the reason I, I love the books, I still do. I read AA Comes of Age. And I was looking for facts, and there weren't any. And nobody's been gathering the facts. And if you want to know about Alcoholics Anonymous history, and if you want to write about it, and if you want to hold yourself out as an expert, you know why they're talking about 1942 or 1944 on? Because they don't want to look back at the real heart of AA, which was being journalized by Ann Smith. And so if you really want to know what AA history is about spiritually, you know, I said I was really going to dig in on the Ann Smith stuff because I'm a salesman for this Ann Smith. <laughs> the kids, I think they put it on the back. Dick is relentless in his <laughs> pursuit of the facts about our mother. Yes, I am. Yes, I am. Because I can see her significance in the letters about her and in the journal itself. Bob put in the foreword to the book I wrote about his mom. 
the way that the help was given, steadfast love was shown, was so subtle, so unassuming, so void of self-seeking that only a few know of the debt that's owed. That's why we don't know much about Ann Smith because she wasn't tooting her horn. She was sitting in a corner in her own home, almost blind, most of the time, and they called it her dark little corner, and people sought her out, and she wasn't tooting her horn, she wasn't writing books, and to this very day, her own little notebook has never been published. She wasn't asking for anything. She was giving and loving. And maybe that's the best reason why a lot of people don't know about her, and why I'm so... I'd like so much to see some of you get acquainted with Anne because if there's any message to be carried about love and service, uh, Annie was the epitome of it. Now, in just a few moments, I think I did this last year, and, uh, and I might just read you a couple of things, no, not to fill in time, but just to show you what she was writing. Uh, she said, you know, on step one, the unmanageable life, what do you do when you pray? O oh Lord, manage me, for I can't manage myself. That we are so in touch with the Holy Spirit that He can give us at that moment a message that is accurate and adequate. This, that is the release you want with people. Your prayer should always be different and straight to the point. Surrender is a simple act of will. What do we surrender? Our life. When? At a certain definite moment. How? O oh God, manage me, because I can't manage myself. And then, um, we must be in such a relationship with God that He can guide us to get in a relationship with God. It takes the whole power of Christ to help us do the smallest thing. The step that puts man in a position to receive the grace of God who alone commands. Surrender sins and wills, putting God's will ahead. whole thing begins to work. <laughs> How does it work? <laughs> Surrender your sins and put God's will ahead, and then the whole thing begins to work. One of the people at the AA meeting was saying that his life, and I know who it was now, his life's basically the spiritual sustenance he needed, even though he's got a lot of sobriety, has been in the last three years when he's really found out about believing in God and the importance of doing his will. I'm misstating it to some extent, but that was the gist of what I heard. And then she quotes William James. She knew all that stuff. And she says, to be converted, to be regenerated, to receive grace, to experience religion, to gain an assurance, are so many phrases which denote the process, gradual or sudden, by which a self, hitherto divided and consciously wrong, inferior and unhappy, becomes unified and consciously right, superior and happy, in consequence of its firmer hold upon religious realities. Surrender is the complete handing over of our wills to God. First step, the life and will. Surrender fears, sins, most of their all their wills. And then on self-examination, why are people so afraid to face their deepest problems? Because they think there's no answer. Boy, oh boy, if you want to know about fear. Why are we afraid to come into Alcoholics Anonymous? Why are we afraid to do a fourth step? Why are we afraid to step out in life? Because we think there's no answer. I got two or three guys now, a couple of the drunks in the house, and they're beginning to get their self-confidence back. And I said, you'll really be going someplace when you realize that God is with you wherever you are. That's the confidence. You know you don't have to personally have the answer. And she says, when they learn there is one, they will believe it work can work out for them and they will be really honest about themselves. It's absolutely necessary to, pay face, to face people with the moral test. Fundamentally, sin is independence toward God, living without God. Seeing oneself as God sees one brings hatred out of sin. Much criticism, she says, is secondhand gossip. And she said it's not self examination, but God's examination. And I'll move on down through some of the other step stuff. She talks about fear, she talks about resentment. 
And then she talks about teamwork. She said, sharing the only basis of scriptural work. Sharing builds a fellowship. Sharing builds a team. Honest sharing issues and action. The only reason we don't share is because we can't see the victory. You know, if you get, excuse me, if you want to get, well, I, I want to say this. I didn't come into Alcoholics Anonymous to stop drinking. Surprise, surprise. That's me. I didn't come in to stop drinking. I came in because it seemed like there was no hope. And somebody said go. My ex-wife did. And I came in and I could see hope. Not of stopping drinking. I don't even think I wanted to stop drinking. I just stopped drinking because my doctor said he might hospitalize me if I did and that Alcoholics Anonymous was a good alternative. I wanted things to get better. I wanted to get out of the misery that I was in and the trouble and the fear and the desperation. And so I came in and I was willing to share honestly because I could see a victory. I had a sense that when they said, keep coming back, it works, it did. Nobody ever scowls at the end of a meeting when they say, keep coming back, it works. It's just the opposite. Keep coming back, it works. And they look like it does. And I didn't know what it was, and I wasn't sure what worked or how it worked or anything else, but I just, something had to be better. And after about four months, I didn't think it was going to get any better, so like a lot of us, I wanted to kill myself. But the victory comes, and you know, she's had the perspective on this, all of this, about sharing. All sharing must be under guidance. You do not tell everybody everything every time, but you are ready to tell anybody anything at any time under guidance. There is nothing in our lives that not, we're not willing to share. It's the quality of willingness. You'd think you were reading the big book. Never betray a confidence. Never share anybody else's sin. Never involve another against his wishes. No detailed confessions in public. Our stories disclosed in a general way. You see, sometimes newcomers will come into meetings and they'll start telling you. One of my friends who was a doctor said, I just killed somebody on the operating table. And the sponsor rushed over and he said, you don't need to share that much. There may be a cop here. <laughs> yeah. Our stories disclose in a general way. I had a difficult incident on the operating table yesterday. You know, the extent of it sharing in public should be coextensive with the wrong done. I don't know about that. Share specifically, uncomfortably so. Sharing in love with tr without truth or sentimentality. Sharing truth without love and brutality. Pray before you share. And this is the kind of stuff which filled out the early AA program with biblical and spiritual principles. And did she discuss the Bible? Oh, yes. She had a section called Sharing in Relation to the Gospel. Matthew 3, 6, Mark 1, 5, Matthew 4, 1 to 11. Uh, Christ shares his temptations. James 5, 16, share my life. Acts 26, Paul's defense before Agrippa. So, you know, she made the, the Bible come alive. She'd talk about a principle. She'd talk about the Bible. And, and to some extent, this is what I'm going to do here next year if I live that long. I'm going to come back and try to get it very specific so that you can do this sort of thing. And maybe a lot of what I get will be from Ann Smith's journal. And so, you know, that's fifth step stuff. And then she says, look out for denials, protests, self-justification, evasions, undue emotion. You, know, you point the finger at an alcoholic and he says, no, the other guy did it. And we know from the steps that, that isn't what we're supposed to do. We're saying, I know he did it. He was a stinker. But what was my part? You know. Have you a Christ that can rid you of your sins and send you on your way rejoicing, she said? What's make, what makes us ineffective? Trying to keep up appearances, pride and station of life, self-pity, the most unnerving atmosphere in which one can live, memory of unshared sins. And then about conversion. Conversion. This is the turning to God, the decision, the surrender. A maximum experience of Jesus Christ leads to a radical change in personal life, bringing about a selfless relationship to people about one, which is a challenge to those we come in contact with. 
And then moving on to restitution, she said, God can make me willing in the day of His power. Joy comes in being committed right to the very end. Attempt great things of God and see the daily victories of the living God. This involves ent and enterprises discipleship under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Running up our colors and helping others to run up there. What a cool way to sponsor somebody. Run up your colors. Let them know you're in the battle zone. You're somebody. You're a son of God. Boy, this gal really had some powerful stuff and practical stuff after surrender. The difference is that when you discover sin and problems in your life, you know the answer and you have the cure. There must be a focus of the issue when the mind is made up, then follows development. As we go closer to Christ, we keep seeing more sin, but we know the cure. What a great message for a newcomer. Okay, you just did the fifth step, and you feel worthless and like a bum, but there's an answer. It took place a long time ago. Continue in the faith and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel, Colossians 1.23. One of the weaknesses of what may be termed the old evangelism of the maths type was lack of continuance. I think I told you the story of the poor black guy that was outside shaking with, with uh, withdrawal, and I'm sitting with a committee of people who are there trying to figure out how to cure alcoholics. Well, get this guy into detox, please, instead of keeping on. It's follow-through. You know, you don't just take a sponsee and give him your phone card and say, all will be well, call me in the morning. You know, it's, it's the follow-through. And She saw that stuff. Prayer says, why not answered? Until we're ready to fulfill the conditions, the deepest wishes of our heart cannot be realized. She talks about an intercessory prayer. And then she's got some interesting stuff about continuance. Face the past for what it really was. Burn all bridges behind you. Witness to some friend who's come to you. Practice daily surrender, daily quiet time. Be alert for symptoms of letdown. Box to guidance. Let all your reading be guided. Let friends and relationships with others be guided. Unite with a fellowship of kindred souls. Don't try, but trust. This quality of life is an adventure, not an arrival. Worth remembering. And, you know, it's getting toward the end of the trail, but if you just went through her journal, and it's all in my, it's also in Turning Point, if you just went through it, you'd find some doggone many practical ideas for how to live life sober, because this old gal was trying to teach these people, grow up, folks, you're not drinking anymore, there's hope, and look for these little things, and look for the big things, and she talks about pilfering, and petty dishonesty, and borrowing, and not returning, please return my book over there about the books early days read, <laughs> now, and so these simple little things that a sponsor tells you, Anne was telling people, when you bury a sin, don't visit the grave too often, good stuff, never let your zeal flag Maintain the spiritual glow. Maintain the spiritual glow. And then she gets around someplace, if I, I guess I moved it on. But there's a lot of practical stuff in there about how to work with a newcomer. <coughs> Never talk down to a newcomer. Boy, if you want to help somebody to take a drink, just tell them what a bum they are. They know. <laughs> I wanted somebody to tell me I had a chance, that I was somebody. I wanted those guys and those gals that just hugged the life out of me when I wasn't huggable. You know, you just, she had all those concepts. Make somebody feel like somebody because they don't feel like anybody. And they don't feel like much. And she was laying out all this stuff. And some of it found its way into the chapter working with others. But there's a lot of stuff that didn't find its way. Why are we reading all these meditation books and books on shame and guilt and the child within and the child without and the dysfunctional family and on and on? <coughs> the government is about to put out a whole bunch of stuff on how to cure people. God isn't mentioned. <laughs> but Anne has enough practical stuff in there that it kept guys like Earl Treat, who went to Chicago and stayed sober, sober for centuries, and Arch T., who went to Detroit and stayed sober for centuries, and Clarence Snyder, who went to 
Cleveland and stayed sober for centuries, they got their inspiration from Ham, not Bob. He was the severe guy. He just laid out the rules and expected you to follow them. And she gave you the love. And she filled it in with specifics. So with that, if I haven't convinced you by now that you ought to know about Ann Smith and everybody else who wants to write about AA history, because if we're going to talk about, quote, spirituality, our dependence upon God, okay, uh, we're going to end it anyway. <laughs> Thanks. But, you know, if we're going to talk about spirituality, and which is dependence upon God, <coughs> excuse me, if we're going to talk about, I guess somebody else is telling me it's time. <coughs> then we, we certainly could fortify ourselves with a little of Anne's practical advice because it was a very profound woman who, who she came from a very wealthy family and she'd been to a very wealthy woman's college and he, she'd trained to be a teacher so she was no dumbbell more importantly she was sober and if she had all the resentments and fears and guilt and shame that the average alcohol Al-Anon member comes in with when we say it's a family disease those poor souls are sicker than we are they're feeling guilty and ashamed and all this stuff and Anne would hug them and make them feel like somebody and tell them what God could do, do for them and phone them in, on the phone have you quiet, had your quiet time yet dear? And when things got really rough, Anne would go upstairs and get away from it all and have a quiet time. She'd go to God. And she probably was really frustrated with all these ding-dongs marching around the house there. The first one they had got a butcher knife and was trying to kill her. And uh, they had to put him away. And then 15 years later, he got sober and came up to Smitty at the funeral and said, I'm Eddie. And Smitty said, I know. And he says, I've been sober in AA for a year. She must have carried a message even while he was chasing her with that butcher knife. <laughs> so here was a great lady. She had great things to say. She recorded our history. And if I seem like I'm emphasizing her a lot, I am. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and so if you want to know about the spiritual roots in the history, get to know Ann Smith. She said a lot more and did a lot more uh, in terms of working with others than Dr. Bob did. Dr. Bob was the reader. And he had other things to do. He was still trying to restore his practice. But Annie was full-time, full-time volunteer AA. Have a good night's sleep, and we'll see you in the morning. <laughs>